So, thank you. I, I, um, you have to forgive me. I'm sort of an academic at heart, and uh, I don't go to a lot of industry conferences. So I, I, and I'm also very much a compiler geek and programming languages geek. And I've lived in that world for a long time now. So if I say something that doesn't jive or is confusing or I use a terminology or I just start going crazy on NanoPass frameworks or whatever happens to be my, my you know, uh, obsession du jour, then just like stop me and, and we can get back on track. But yeah, I, uh, I, I think it's, it's a little bit interesting how I got into this because I, I actually have been a schemer for a long time and I then became an APLer fairly recently because I thought what is the language uh, about which I had the highest amount of prejudices but knew the least. <laughs> and I decided all right I'm gonna go and learn this and see if it matches up and, and much to my surprise and my colleague's chagrin I liked it and I started uh, hanging out on Usenet uh, the Complang APL group and asking a bunch of questions and a number of people here uh, responded to me and then Morton sent me an email saying why aren't you using dialog and so that started a back and forth where I kept complaining about dialog this dialog that you know and eventually I just found myself using dialog using the licenses and writing defunds and at the same time I was studying um, uh, parallel programming and especially deterministic parallel programming which is a style of programming that allows you to guarantee that your computations are going to give you what you want and that if you have a race or a deadlock in your parallel program that you will always encounter that race or deadlock in any given possible execution of the program and this has a lot of benefits to uh, programmability because you don't have your system randomly freezing when your client runs the program compared to when you ran it and you can't reproduce it ever. Uh, so I was doing this and then I suddenly realized that APL has a great way of expressing a whole lot of parallel computation. It's sort of parallel at the, at the root of it and you only sort of tack on iterative programming as, a, as an afterthought in some sense. But it was lacking a little bit in task parallelism. So I started exploring this idea and realized that this could be an interesting project and then Dialog said, hey, well, let's, let's do it, and, and so we started. And I think the uh, first thing to ask is why on earth are we doing a compiler? Because APL is already actually really fast. It's uh, 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 an amazingly fast interpreter. It's a very impressive bit of work, so why, why should we even consider a compiler at all? And I think most people here would be convinced, we had a number of interesting arguments from Jay and the other things, uh, about the limitations of interpreter overhead, some of the restrictions there. But, and I think, so I don't wanna belabor those particular points because I think it's clear what we have to overcome there. But one of the things that people often overlook in favor of performance is correctness. And in parallel programming, yes, you're trying to make it faster, but it's very, very easy to make a program much, much faster and do it wrong and get the wrong answer. And sometimes, especially if you're dealing with floating point numbers and you're working with large data sets, it's very difficult to tell that you got it wrong until your aircraft crashes or something else happens. And so compilers provide an additional level of capacity for not only improving the performance, but talking about performance and parallelism in terms of reliability and correctness and whether you're actually preserving the semantics of your code and doing the same thing when you do these optimizations. And people work hard to do this and the compiler can help us out. And an interpreter has a much harder time assuring us of these correctnesses than a compiler potentially can. And so the, the two things I wanna focus on in terms of the compiler are reliability and performance and how those two synergistically work together to actually make our lives a lot better. And, and, and I think that the compiler format is really the only format that makes this scalable. And scalability is a big question in um, today's terms of performance. So another aspect of this compiler project is less of an emphasis on micro-optimizations of SIMD architectures and these sorts of things, which the interpreter and runtimes do pretty well, um, People like the, the SAC project have done a great 
job on this, uh, so single assignment C and some of the other systems. But I want to focus this compiler largely on how do we reason and how do we express parallelism in a way that we can reason about it and make our code faster at a, a slightly higher level. And I think APL is, is, is ideally positioned to be able to enable this in ways that other languages just don't compete very well at. So let's look at the limitations of interpreters in general, and Dialog suffers from these uh, to some extent. A lot of these are derived by um, testing that I did with a number of popular scientific computing benchmarks that uh, leverage um, parallelism and leverage large data sets to see um, what, how well a, a system can work. And scalar um, fusion, I, I should change this. Scalar fusion, when I talk about scalar fusion, I'm actually saying scalar function fusion. And I'll, I'll define that term a little bit later on, but this is a, a, a very specific optimization that I'm going to focus on, and interpreters have a very hard time dealing with this particular optimization. And, and it's a very critical optimization when we're talking about the scalability of large data set computations or even just scaling your system out in parallel. This is, a, this is a big issue. And another big problem is when you're doing certain optimizations, if you have to take into account how much it's going to cost to call a function or how much it's going to cost to expand something out and ex, uh, you know, uh, make certain elements explicit for certain behaviors, you can often, even though that theoretically could be faster, you now have to worry about, well, will the interpreter overhead kill that? And in a lot of cases, the interpreter overhead will kill those particular optimizations that you might want to do. But a compiler can eliminate a significant amount of procedure call overhead in certain cases that make this not, not so much of a problem. And even just common optimizations that everybody wants their code to do, and everybody sort of intuitively expects the compiler to be able to do, at least when you're learning computer science, you say, well, why can't it do this? And it can usually if you've got a compiler that implements some of these optimizations. And for those who want to hear all the compiler geekiness, we can get into that at some point if you want. Um, and finally, static analysis is very difficult for an interpreter. And static analysis is often what uh, gives us some of these benefits, both in terms of correctness, error reporting, uh, fail fast sort of problems, or uh, doing subtle optimizations that uh, are, are important when we're trying to scale out a problem uh, to, to um, these HPC systems or something like this. And Dialog's interpreter does a really remarkable job of this last part in terms of idiom recognition. Very few interpreters do idiom recognition as well as Dialog does. But idiom recognition is still a special casing situation and this, it's, it's difficult to scale that particular optimization technique to the full breadth of what we might like to do. Um, just in terms of manpower and code complexity and correctness and, and so forth. So the code defunds uh, system is largely my jump right into APL. Uh, as pretty much as soon as I started realizing how much I liked APL, I wanted to write a compiler for it. You know, I, I, you know I, we, we really like to geek out about our compilers at IU. We, I think everybody at the program has written a compiler and is writing another compiler that they want to call themselves their own. And uh, so we have umpteen number of compilers sitting around and, and we just argue back and forth about whose compiler is better and doing, yeah, but... <laughs> Uh, so, I, I want to make a note at this point, jumping into this compiler, what sort of allowed me to have some confidence in jumping into this compiler was that defunds existed in the first place. And I think, I think defunds has lowered the barrier of entry to doing a lot of this stuff than it would have been possible uh, if I didn't see that. Uh, not to say that you couldn't potentially do the same things, and ideally speaking, we want to scale, it would be nice to scale these sorts of uh, ideas out to traditional functions or other types of programming, but the defunds system is really a nice, clean target from a point of view of trying to solve these problems and make good things happen. And without that, I think it would have been a much more challenging uh, prospect to to even embark on this uh, the system. So let's harp on this. This is this is my my pet peeve. 
Uh, this I, uh, I, I had done some benchmarking in Dialog, and I was so excited because I had written some code that ran as fast as C, and sometimes faster than the naive one if I didn't put in the special optimization uh, flags that you have to know about and all this other stuff in GCC and blah, blah, blah. So I was excited, and then I went, all right, let's try this one. Let's see how it goes. And this is, uh, this is one of the examples that really ruined my day. Um, but this is, a, this is a computation from a Black-Scholes benchmark. And it's a fairly simple benchmark. There's another benchmark from the uh, NAS parallel benchmark suite that does uh, sparse matrix vector product multiplication, that sort of thing. You guys have seen some of that before. It's a, they're fairly common operations, but they all do large-scale operations on large data sets and have chains of scalars. And that's the important part. We have here these... This is an entirely scalar function that just has lots of scalar computation, and certain of those variables are reused, and they're large. And Dialog goes to relatively great lengths to make sure that this is pretty fast. But when you get to a certain height, a certain scale, you run into memory problems. And when it comes to parallel performance, I think I'm relatively safe in saying that memory is king. If you can't properly handle the way you work with your memory, and especially the memory hierarchy, then you're totally hosed. And with a large system like this, or when we're doing with large data on a scalar computation like this, what happens is the interpreter doesn't have the capacity to recognize this as scalar and fuse these operations together so that we operate at each element individually and do all the computation on each element. And that's the fast way to do it. Because that allows the uh, CPU or the distributed system to cache the local data quickly into registers or into L1 cache or something like this, keep that data around for the whole process of the computation, which the CPUs are fast at, and then move on to the next data item where the memory cost is excessive. Uh, and with distributed systems, we're talking about network latency, and those can be very high sometimes. So what you get with that is basically having to blow your cache every single time you go through the scalar operations. And in some of my benchmarks, this was as bad as 100 times slowdown compared to what you could have had. Um, whereas, you know, we've got one version of... We've got some code running as fast as C or faster, and then we've got other code that's running 100 times slower, and it's almost entirely down to memory optimizations. And we could have done some additional work um, in the interpreter to maybe add a segmented scan primitive or do something like this that would have helped make it more cache friendly. But fundamentally, this sort of operation is, is, is a difficult thing for an interpreter to take um, and, and do something clever with. And it's an easy thing for a compiler to do. Uh, in fact, this is almost one of the first optimizations that any compiler writer doing this sort of optimizations goes for. Um, the Accelerate libraries in Haskell, for instance, that do GPU programming, they do a lot of work on fusing scalar operations. And this makes a, a huge difference in how well they can perform at scale, either in massive GPU computing or high-performance computing, or even just multi-core where you've got potential memory contention. And, and I... Uh, you know, th solving these kinds of problems are, are a really big target for a, uh, a compiler. And especially a compiler that's interested in scalable parallel performance. So, in that example, one of the things that really made me uh, a little bit upset was that I couldn't predict without... I, it was, at least, I didn't have a good model to predict how that performance was going to uh, go. It, and... And so code defunds, one of its design philosophies is, is to try to um, make predictable the kind of optimization you're going to get, or at least allow you to get a handle on performance. And so it's not going to go for this super compilation where we're going to magically turn everything into this shiny, fast, blazing unicorn of light or something like this. But instead, it's going to provide the tools necessary for you to talk and reason about parallelism and uh, per performance so that you can get to where you want to go performance-wise without having to guess along the way. And that's, that's sort of an important design choice. 
And I did end up, I'm, I'm, in a, I'm in the programming languages group. I couldn't help myself. I had to extend the language. <laughs> I, I just had to do it. But after spending a week in Bramley arguing at a blackboard with, I think, Roger and Jay and a number of other people, I, uh, we, we, we managed to identify sort of the salient ideas that were necessary for me to get what I wanted without driving everyone insane. And it comes down to these two symbols. And uh, Morton has shown you the, the, the right symbol uh, before, and I call this the par operator. And when it comes to the, the isolates and futures, it's functionally equivalent, basically. <laughs> So when, when it comes to that broad, large, coarse-grained computation, that operates the same way. But the terminology here I'm going to use is slightly different because I'm trying to work at very, very lightweight multiprogramming so that the cost of spawning a thread is extremely small, both in terms of memory and processing power. So this operator in CodeDefunds doesn't spawn an isolate. Instead, it spawns a thread inside of a lightweight threading environment that's either, and the, however the runtime dispatches that onto a distributed cluster or onto GPUs or something else is, is up for grabs. But fundamentally, what it returns is a function that will compute the same uh, results as the operand, but with a single assignment array. And this is one of the, this, this is one of the critical design features of CodeDefunds is this single assignment array. And that is the symbol on the left. Our target is, is single assignment, which is the, basically it's a constant, which is exactly the same as the empty vector, except that its fill element is a single assignment cell that has been unassigned. And so we can look at some examples of what, how, how this behavior works. Basically, we can treat the target just like an empty vector. It works the same way, except that when we reshape it, for instance, like this, or do anything where we're going to work with the fill element, instead of giving us, say, zero or an empty character, a blank or a space, it gives us this empty, unassigned cell. And so up in the first line, we have x being a 5 by 5 single assignment matrix. And the rules say that you can write to one of those cells at most once. You can read as many times as you want, but you can only write to it once. And you can refer to that cell just like it was any other cell. Uh, and we see those, the assignment and the reading in the second and third lines. But if a cell has not been assigned, then you will block until somebody has written into that cell. And in the computer science parlance, this is called an IVAR. And we've scaled it up slightly and made it APL-ish by making it all implicit. So instead of having an explicit IVAR that captures it and then you extract it out and push it back in, it behaves just like any other array and you just get this synchronization behavior. And this, is, this, this single assignment property is really critical to reasoning about your code because if you work with parallel programming at all, you probably have run into race conditions or semaphores or having, you know, maybe you're a Herculean programmer and you never deadlock at all, ever, and you just, you know, you just constantly do nice work and um, I don't even think Knuth manages that, but the, the idea here is, is that if you have these IVARs and you only write into IVARs globally, so your, your threads only communicate across IVARs, then you've got a deterministic program. So that if you have a problem, you will always deadlock or you won't deadlock and you're, you're okay. And this is, this is a really critical idea to being able to reason about your parallel programs and especially about scaling your programs up and making sure that you've avoided problems. And to, to, to do this, you actually have to have a way of spawning multiple concurrent threads, hence the code defunds. And that's just one with the, the parallel operator. And so that, the, F, the F par each is just a simple way of doing a parallel each. And importantly, that's going to come out just like the regular f each. It's, it's exactly the same semantically, except that um, it's working with a single assignment array instead of a, a global. And here down here, we have the, the, uh, the grotesque uh, 
smallest, shortest, fullest example. Um, so we have a vector reduce over um, scalar elements, but I've tweaked it a bit um, to illustrate some of the concepts here. So what we've done is we started with um, z, which is going to be our fill vector, which is the same size as our incoming vector, but it's going to be a single, empty single assignment array. And then we're going to fill up that vector. And we're going to fill it up by the first element's going to be the first element of the input. And then for every other element, we're going to do this computation in the center, where we reference the previous index, compute the function that we've been given with the current input value that we're reducing over. And then I, I, uh, I didn't put it on here for space, but th then you're going to actually grab the last element out of that vector and, and return it. And this is a serial program that uses the parallel operations for synchronization. So you have, um, you spawn as many, you spawn one less threads than you have elements in your vector. And each of these threads has a data dependency on the results of the previous thread computation index-wise. And you don't have to do any explicit synchronization here. Instead, your control is synchronized based on the data dependencies that you've implicitly specified in your, in your program through the reads and writes to these single assignment arrays. And this is a, a very powerful technique because it allows you to basically achieve everything that you can do with the other control structures, but without having to worry about using them correctly. And data dependency is uh, using data dependencies as a means of synchronization is something that a number of uh, systems have, have studied and it, it comes out quite well. Uh, Intel's CNC is, is an example of this, their concurrent collection system, and I was inspired a little bit by that work. Um, I leave it as an exercise to the reader to see how they would implement a more efficient vector reduce using a, a, a divide and conquer algorithm in this, in this approach. And then we can take the game of life function, which I I think I got right, but I might not have, so forgive me. Uh, <laughs> uh, but the, if we start with a regular game of life, we could naively just put par at the end of it, but that's probably not going to do very much. So instead, we can think about what's going to happen inside, and we can put these two pars inside and just stick them there. And by doing that, we'll have parallelized the outer product operations that they do. Now, whether this is going to be fast or not depends on data representations and a number of other things. But the fundamental point is that it's as easy to read, or nearly as easy to read that third line as it is to read the first version of the life. And you can reason about it the same way. And, and that's, that's sort of an in, a, a nice property to have. And the compiler can do interesting stuff with this. Because if the compiler sees that we have a single assignment array, it can actually start doing additional computation without that array being fully populated yet. This allows us to do pipelining, which is a, a type of optimization that allows us to queue up operations and be doing more in the future if we can do it without having to wait for all of the previous computation to be done. And we have an implicit sync point where we have that equals, which is going to wait for everything to finish up. Um, but we could have allowed more parallelism to, into the system with more pars and allowed po more potential pipelining type of parallelism if we wanted to. The, the, the ability to reason about performance is, is something I think people don't focus on enough. And in APL, the fact that we can easily reason about our code allows us to confidently make certain changes to that code which might not have been obvious uh, before. So, for example, uh, a number of the op optimizations we've seen today, if you tried to do that in another language, you'd have to spend a little time thinking about whether that was correct or not, and whether that was actually safe. Um, and I've, I've seen the trouble that some people go through to do this. And with, with a language like APL, a lot of times it's much more obvious uh, whether that's safe or not. And I want to make parallelism as easy as possible. And so if I'm going to reason about my code, uh, 
I already have APL. APL is a math, right? Sort of. And math lets you reason about things. And APL can reason about APL because important properties are first class in the language. So let's use APL to reason about APL so that we can get our performance going. The idea here is, for example, we had a question before about where do we find this book of optimizations, essentially. Or we, and and for, op, for doing all this code, writing fast code, there's all this expert knowledge sitting around, but it's not put into a form that's easy to use. So a lot of these optimization techniques are given in English prose or little guidebooks or hints in blog posts or uh, by consulting with the dialogue consultancy or anything like this. And we have to sort of learn this bag of tricks that we can apply applying them as a manual process and learning about them is a very tedious process sometimes and trying to figure out why they're going to do what they do. And there's not really a lot of information that's easily accessible that allows us to say, oh, well, this is an optimization. I know this is going to be useful here. Go do it. Let's have this happen. And this is something I want people who are working in defunds to be able to do if they want to. Not everybody is going to want to do this. But if you see something and say, no, that should be this. It should go fast. There's no reason that you should not be allowed to do that. There's no reason that you should not have control over the, the optimizer, basically, without having to learn how to program a compiler. And so, for instance, as somebody else uh, mentioned declarations. And uh, I have uh, the, the current long-range ideas of this is to essentially use APL as its own type system in a gradual typing framework. Um, which, if people want to know exactly what that is, uh, we can talk about that. But the, here we have three examples where you see the uh, angle brackets. The angle brackets aren't actually code that gets executed. They're declarations about the properties of code that's been defined in the environment. And so, for instance, a simple one would be the shape of the life function is just the shape of the input array. Um, or we could say, if we know that a given function is associative, I hope I got that properly right, I always confuse commutative and associative, but if we, got, if we did that and we got that right, and the compiler can check that for us, then we can do a much faster reduce, or take advantage of things to implement a nice reduce. And for a general function, any function that we can prove this property about, any function we can just convince ourselves that this holds, and the compiler says, yeah, okay, that's, that's good, you've convinced me, this is, this is cool. Then the compiler can now say, oh, well, since I know that's associative, let's go do it. Let's, let's take advantage of that. And we can do much more uh, sophisticated declarations. For example, uh, a function having a, uh, you know, doing outer products, there are certain benchmarks that a naive quadratic um, computation, can, we can actually cut the constant factor by two simply because we can use a cheaper function to compute half of the matrix because it's a triangle inverse something modulo, uh, you know, a, a, the negative sign or something like this. And we can encode that property into our code and say, yes, use this and take advantage of that. And for instance, here we have scale, an example of scalar function fusion, which is an amazingly useful but simple optimization. So if we can say G is a scalar function, then we can take us that string of scalar computation, which might blow our cache, and convert it into something that does each scalar operation individually as we go through. And furthermore, we can recognize the fact that our input array has a fixed size now in this function, and it's only going to be called with that, so we can optimize the way we call the, product, uh, the procedures and get rid of allocation costs in the procedure calls and store all of those into registers, and now we don't have to worry about the cost of stuffing something into a vector and extracting it back out. And we can do a number of other things in terms of shapes and sizes and allocations to, to save us memory, to put the memory in the right place, to make our cache locality as good as we can get. And so let's look at Eugene's optimizations. Um, so here we have the scalar optimization. And uh, this is just like a sort of imagine this sort of I idea. Um, but let's say we don't have go-tos. And instead, this branch allows us to create a rewrite rule that is checked by our compiler for being correct. 
and allows us say, to say, if we have this thing here, if we can demonstrate that our, a variable is a scalar and that we have a, a deep map uh, or a scalar function over that, and we see this bad coding practice, this reshape, reshape of S or something like the, the, this, this, this um, what do we call it, conforming? Is that the right term? If, this this uh, explicit con conforming, well, get rid of that. It doesn't matter, and we can eliminate it. And now the compiler, every time it sees this, can do that optimization for you automatically. And similarly, we can take that and say, okay, but now what happens if somebody puts it on the other side? Well, now we can take another rewrite rule that says, well, if we see a scalar function and, the sc and we have a scalar on one side, we'll put it on the other side, or something like this. And so this is a way of encoding those properties programmatically, those optimizations in a way that the compiler can apply them. And in addition to that, you can build up libraries of optimizations and treat them just like code. And so now you don't have to remember all of these optimizations yourself. Somebody can write the optimizations for a particular domain and give them to you, and you can then use them without having to understand, you know, have them all embedded in your head and do all the transformation manually. And this is sort of what's possible with a compiler that, can, that enables you to reason about your code like this. Some plans, we, we, I, I want to target the GPU, I want to target distributed computing. The first version, I'm hoping to have something out that people can play with by, by the end of this year. And it needs to fully integrate in with dialogue. So uh, the, the idea being that it, you, you, you won't have to really change how you do a lot of your work to get, this, this, um, to get the benefit of the compiler. Um, and we're, again, we're focusing on parallel performance here, so we're not trying to be another runtime implementer that gets really good SIMD vectorized operations or some of these. Um, so we're just going to, for the first version that people will be able to see, it'll just be sort of the low-hanging fruit optimizations, the simple ones that you know, are obvious and ought to be around, and then just to give people a chance to improve it and provide input. And we really want as much feedback and as much code to run and play with and compile as possible, uh, if, if at all possible. So quickly, a few differences between the compiler and the interpreter. The compiler is, gar the compiler is stack based allocation, so that you have a little bit more predictability and control over your allocation behavior. It doesn't use a garbage collector. Um, it tries to um, do some whole program optimizations. Um, and it, it, the idiom based optimization should be able to be sort of just plugged in and uh, provide you with uh, the ability to do. Uh, more error correctness and checking of your code, um, both automatically and manually. And it will be restricted right now to code defunds. Um, there's no reason why there couldn't be layers on top that get you from tr traditional functions to something that the compiler can handle, and that would be interesting to see. Um, and it's not going to replace this huge, massive integration that Dialog has with a number of other external systems. Um, but it should be really easy to use. And that's, that's an important thing. So just, uh, I, I'm glad we have little time so that I don't have to show too much of a demo here. But the basic idea, I, I just want to give you an idea of what it would feel like to use the system. Assuming I can type. So you would load in the system, and then uh, the full general element Whoa, oh dear. Yeah. Um, and this is extremely research code, so expect it to break. Okay. So basically, it would replace quad FX or quad fix, and you'd be able to run it, and it would give you a namespace that you could just use then as a regular namespace. Or if you wanted, you can go in and you can take this foo dot LL file, which is just an LLVM. Uh, it's been compiled to an LLVM, so then you can use the Clang compiler, the C++ compiler, and create a regular object from that and link it into whatever system you want. And so you can plug or embed this into any system that you want, just link against the runtime DLL, and you've got APL in your web browser that you're creating or your 
video game or whatever it is that you happen to be doing. Um, and that's really as simple as it should be. It shouldn't be any more complicated than that to make things happen. Uh, so, however, just because it's easy to use does not mean performance is easy. Yes, it should cost you very little in terms of programmer time to go and just develop it, but to make it fast is still going to require you to do a little work. Um, and if anybody's interested in the coding goodies, there's a lot of interesting things about this project, you can come talk to me. Uh, but I, I, I want to acknowledge the, the, the funding that Dialog's provided, which has enabled me to spend a lot of time thinking about these problems and making something happen. And the PL group at IU has been a remarkably uh, fruitful place to make this happen. And of course, the creator of defunds, <laughs> which I think uh, is a very big uh, reason for this project existing in the first place. So thank you. Uh, yeah. And I guess, was that on time? Are we? Yeah, we have three, four minutes. Three, four, okay, sure. Okay, hang on. Um, in your two new function symbols, I didn't notice any, unless I missed it, uh, some uses of the concentric circles. Ah, yes, the concentric circle is used, target is what I call it. It's used all over the place, so, yeah. So here, you, don't act, you can actually do pure fork join programming parallelism without ever using the target. The target is for sophisticated, nested task parallelism where you've got multiple things reading and writing common data stores and you're going all over the place rather than the common fork join method that people use. So you don't have to use the target if you don't feel the need to. But it gives you that extra control. Um, I think we had a question. There. Yeah, one of the things I th periodically think about doing in Apex is to introduce cost models for everything. And since I've got, yes. since I have the entire compilation unit available there, we can then be in a position to ask questions about, suppose I scale up the, this input by a factor of yi, what yes. is the performance gonna look like? That's, and, and that's actually a really- How hard would that be? So yeah. I'm, I'm actively looking into this because there is a particular case of, of naive algorithms which have abysmal memory performance in APL uh, namely interpreters and other things that are extending your array which represents an environment by one element each time. And if you do this in a pure functional style, you're going to have a tree of arrays, each of which is one greater than the previous one. So you have a copy at each level in the tree and it's just a massive memory problem. But that's a place where a cost model would be great because if the cost model identified these behaviors and the, the kind of cost it took to, to do this then you could say, oh, well, I need to use a different allocation uh, strategy under the hood to get better performance for this type of behavior. And I, I really want to look at something like that, that allow, and, and be able to express it in the, in the language. Yeah. Thank you.